Okay, Matt. <clears throat> Excuse me, Matt. Please have your attention. Um, it falls to me today the task of introducing uh, Dr. Lynn Siri Kimsey, uh, Professor of Entomology as well as Director of the Bohart Museum, and rather unfortunately for her, also my spouse. <laughs> um, and uh, and today's seminar, she's going to be talking about a rather interesting series of expeditions that uh, I have been dragged along on, squalling and screaming by one ear. Uh, into Indonesia with regards to um, a uh, rather interesting grant, International Cooperation or Cooperative Biodiversity um, um, Group uh, Program Grant that uh, was actually is funded by a consortium of NIH and NSF, which is really an odd, odd sort of arrangement. Uh, it was put together initially by Dr. Dan Potter here on this campus as well as Dr. Elizabeth Wheat. Wijaya in uh, Indonesia um, as sort of a collaborative effort to go into a region in south uh, eastern Sulawesi that is completely uninhabited. Although it's been explored, there are very few people that ever go up into it um, and look at biodiversity as well as do uh, some bioprospecting. Um, the, and so there have been approximately four or five such ex expeditions into this region. Uh, I've had the good fortune of actually being on two of them. Um, so one of the things I'd like to say at the outset, uh, just from my own personal standpoint, that these expeditions are really just exactly that. They're not, they're non-trivial exercises in getting into a region that's almost impossible to get into. And we couldn't possibly have done it without the extraordinary efforts and collaboration that we have with a bunch of really wonderful Indonesian scientists. And so, and as well as a a group of young men, I, I'm old enough now that I can call them young men and get away with it, called the Chitaka, who, who are our guides. And so Lynn is going to be talking to you today not only about the grant, but also these, ex, these expeditions and some of the wonderful things that we've discovered uh, uh, on these trips. Lynn. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is a very unusual grant, and there are a few of them around. They tend to be renewed there for five years at a time. It's actually collaboration among a whole bunch of agencies. So it's not only just National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health, but it's also DOE, USDA, and then we also have um, the Fogarty, which is the primary organizer of the grants, and then we also have three or four Indonesian agencies that are collaborators on this. So it's, if you, if you can imagine the reporting lines that are necessary with this kind of grant, fortunately I'm not the PI, I'm a bunch screaming in the other direction, but it allows us a fair amount of funding for doing these projects. And here are some of the part, these are the faculty and, and scientist participants. So you can see there are a lot of people involved. It's a $5 million grant. Uh, what comes to Davis campus is approximately one-tenth of that. The money goes all over from Indonesia to Berkeley to UC Santa Cruz. Um, we have expertise in practically everything. So a big chunk of the bioprospecting is actually microbial biodiversity that we're looking at. So at the same time that we're sampling plants, animals of various kinds, we're also taking tissue samples. Uh, we're looking at endosymbionts and wood feeding insects. We're taking bark samples to look for compounds of pharmaceutical or industrial importance. I'm not interested in that particularly because this site is one of the most unbelievably <coughs> biodiverse regions I've ever been in and practically everything is new. So these were our project goals. One would be to survey the forest, look at the biodiversity. Next, to survey four potential natural products of pharmaceutical or you know, industrial applications. Develop recommendations from this work for conservation of the forests and a way of conserving traditional knowledge bases. Develop outreach programs to the local communities and to universities there in Indonesia that are actually going to have legs and continue after the project is over with. And at the same time, we had to develop intellectual property agreements and material transfer agreements with Indonesia because we had to take tissue 
whole plants, whole animals out of country to do analyses, bring them back and forth. And so that in and of itself was probably more than a year's worth of work. Why Sulawesi? Sulawesi is off of everyone's radar. When you think of Indonesia, you always think of Borneo or Sumatra, maybe Java. But this is an old map, so it used to be called the Celebes. Sulawesi is really the biological holy grail. It sits between Wallace's line and Weber's line. Dispersal is practically the only way anything gets there, and yet these are deep ocean trenches on either side of the island. It has a geological history that reinforces this isolation. It actually has very little volcanism. It is primarily formed by three plates smashing together in this particular place. The Australian, Eurasian, <coughs> and Pacific plates smashed into each other in this particular corner, and that's what Sulawesi was formed from. So parts of it are highly metamorphic. A little bit of volcanism up here in the north, but most of this down here is serpentines, gneiss, and schists, and also some big limestone deposits sort of sandwiched on top and on bottom of everything. So it's a very, very peculiar place. Our study site is right here, so it's right at one of these zones of collision, you might say. As Bob said, it's not a place that's easy to get to. Because the first thing you have to do is you have to fly from San Francisco to Jakarta because you have to spend a week in Jakarta getting your research permits, your immigration permits, your other permits. And then once you've done that, you have to fly kind of backwards to Sulawesi to the capital city of Kendari for this particular province. Then from Kendari, it's a seven hour drive across the peninsula from Kendari to Kolaka, that's a seven hour drive. And then from Kolaka, you have to drive to Tinokari, which is a little teeny village up here. And then every camp that we had to get into, we had to pack into by foot. So the last camp is a, basically a three to five day pack in uh, on foot. And everything has to be packed. So here are the camps. Tinokari is this little tiny village on the main road. First camp, you have to go up a river, you pour the river six times to get in, and then you follow sort of along a ridge line to get to the other camps. Basically, you go from sea level to almost 3,000 meters by the time you get to the last camp. So we actually have a group going in at the end of this month to do the final surveys at the top of the mountain. And here's kind of what we've done. So we have camps at these different elevations where we have set out transects and surveyed all the plants along the transects, done bird observations, trapped mammals, collected herbs, ran malaise traps. So we were running roughly 60 malaise trap hours per transect per field visit. So we go twice a year because it's the only time you can get into this site is at the beginning or the end of the rainy season, dry season transition, and um, yeah. So just, I thought I'd put in a comparison to show you kind of the two places where I'm currently working. One is in the Algodonas Dunes in California, which is 200 square miles of sand, and the other one is Mekonga Mountain, which is 200 square miles of rainforest. Here we have five hundredths of an inch of rain per year. Here we have 10 meters of rain per year. Maybe 100 species of plants in the sand dunes, over 1,000 on the Mekonga Mountain. But the really phenomenal numbers are when you get to the numbers of insects. So we estimate about 2,000 species of insects on the sand dunes. And I would guess a minimum of 100,000 on, on this mountain. If you're a taxonomist, it's the kind of thing that makes you either want to cry or commit suicide. <laughs> so here's our crew. And you know, this is a tropical rainforest, right? But you notice I'm wearing a heavy sweater. And what we found is the higher we got, the colder it got once we got acclimated to Indonesian sort of temperature regimens. So these are the bulk of the scientists, none of the porters or the chitaka 
the Chautauqua, it's a climbing club kind of like Sherpas, but they hire themselves out to take people up mountains, and they're the ones that organize the camps, do the cooking, make sure we didn't kill ourselves, help us get across the river, and so on. So this is the beginning of the climb. So we have to go up this river, the Masembo River. This is low elevation, practically sea level, and they have coconut plantations down this low. So we have to go up the river this way and then back along the mountain line. So this is our 100 meter camp. The forest at this level is all second growth. It's dominated by figs and there are about 30 species of fig trees in this site. Chocolate plantations. So this is actually a plantation house that they let us use as a staging area for the camp at this, this uh, elevation. 12 species of bamboo, the endemic Sulawesi hornbill is found here. Two species of macaques, uh, chigger mites, and the Indonesian warty pig, which is probably what's feeding the chigger mites, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> so this is a phenomenal bird. The Indonesian hornbill, it's got a wingspan of about four and a half feet. Um, they make sort of a chuckling bark. They're very common in this area. And then the macaques as well. So this, since Indonesia is primarily a Muslim country, no one eats the monkeys. So the monkeys are in really good shape, healthy populations. The figs are bizarre. This is a coliform fig. The, the flower fruits are actually produced at the base of the trunk. And in this case, an ant species has now come up and covered it with its nest material. So there's actually an ant nest underneath that nest with the figs. I don't know what that does for the figs, but it's pretty common. <coughs> the next camp was about 900 meters. I, I've left one out. There's actually an intermediate camp. But this is the one we went to, one of the ones we went to this past June. All of a sudden, at 900 meters, no more figs. They drop out completely. There's no agriculture at this elevation. The hornbill disappears. Well, still a few monkeys, but practically none at this point. And the understory is dominated by begonias of all things, and suddenly there aren't any more chiggers. We have something much more fun. <laughs> yeah, the chiggers. So Bob didn't want me to use this picture, but there are at least three people in this department who have had leeches on their eyeball. And so I just thought I'd have to include this for, you know, general purposes. But the, the leeches, they're not very big. These are land leeches. They're kind of pretty before they fed. And, you know, when everything was said and done, by the time we got out of this field site back in town, um, the leeches actually looked pretty good compared to the other ectoparasites. So. This is a 1,500 meter camp. Um, here, the forest yet again changes. So at this elevation, suddenly the forest is dominated by lithocarpus. So the first time I realized this, I was out collecting and I realized that I was walking in acorns, or what I thought were acorns. And lithocarpus is an oak sister group, and they produce acorns, which just seems wrong when you're in a rainforest in Indonesia. Uh, lots of pandanus, lots of rattan. We had Nepenthes pitcher plants, which are very cool. And we got into a region that has the Anoa dwarf buffalo, which is a species native to Sulawesi. We never saw them because by the time we got that high, our camps were so smelly and we smelled so bad that they steered clear of us because the Indonesians do hunt them. And so they, we found plenty of sign, <laughs> and unfortunately, they have little friends too, and that was what we got into. So the leeches dropped out at this elevation, then we got the ticks, which were infinitely worse. Camp life, yeah, everything you use there has to be carried on your back or someone's back. This is our kitchen. I couldn't get a picture of the cook, but he has a cigarette hanging out of his mouth with a big ash on it. He's actually leaning over the, the walk that he's looking at the <laughs> Um, for some reason, the bees, stingless bees, dwarf honeybees, and giant honeybees just thought our sweat was the finest thing that they ever seen in their lives. And so all of our equipment was covered with it during the day. And then to add to the sort of general commotion in the camp, the giant hornets would come in to prey on the bees that were coming to our sweat on our equipment. So you had to wear shoes all the time because 
they got kind of dicey siblings. So the way you set up a camp in this region is you lay down a huge tarp. So they get these blue tarps that come sort of 60 by 90 feet. So you lay that down first, and you put the pop-up tents on top of it. And then you put another big tarp over the top of that. Because, as I said, this region gets 400 plus inches of rain a year. So we're there in the dry season. It rained every afternoon. And I finally said to my colleague, Rosicon, I said, Rosicon, what's the difference between dry season and rainy season? He says, oh, it's simple. It only rains in the afternoon during the dry season. <laughs> I said, Rosica, I'm from California. It doesn't rain for six months. <laughs> oh, he said, that's a very strange place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were other downsides. So this is the result of the chigger mites. Um, because we had to pack all our food in, and because it's very humid, things spoil really fast. Basically, it had to come out of a can, a bag, or a jar. Well, no, no jars. So cans or bags. So we basically lived off of steamed rice and ramen noodles three times a day. And I probably shouldn't tell you this, but, but as an entomologist, you know, you pay attention to certain kinds of things. These camps are small. We've got 15 people packed in them. You get to know pretty much everybody's habits from what they eat to where they go to do their business. Anyway, what we discovered is after the first week on this diet, the dung beetles and the blowflies were no longer interested in our leavings. <laughs> It was like, oh, there's no protein in this. What are you thinking? I'm not coming to this. Because one of our one of the scientists from Indonesia was trapping dung beetles for a project that he was doing. And it was like after the first week he's going, Well, there aren't any dung beetles here. And I'm going, no, that's not the problem. <laughs> but this is sort of the view from the back of the camp. True cloud forest at this situation, this is 1,500 meters. You look out the back of the camp. And half of the day it would be like San Francisco, and about 65 to 70 degrees. So the Chitaka and the Indonesian scientists, they were so cold that by evening they were shivering. And we were running a blacklight, so one of the poor porters had to haul a jerry can of diesel and a generator up this mountain to this site. And we always knew where the Chitaka were going to be when the generator was running because they would all be huddled in the exhaust coming out of the generator because it was warm. It was also the only place we could get our socks dry. <laughs> so going up the mountain, the forest becomes really interesting. It appears that there are not many winds in this, even during storms, because the trees are shaped, they're like little pencils with a little plop at the top. Very long, thin, um, because it's second growth, there aren't too many uh, epiphytes at this point. When we got higher, we got into epiphytes. This area was logged in about uh, the 1960s, and parts of the lower elevations were strip logged by the Japanese. And so this is all regrowth since then. Unbelievable diversity, even though it's second growth. And you can see here, actually, one of the things I didn't realize is that there are there's a native species of casuarina or she oak in Sulawesi, and I didn't realize that they were found outside of New Guinea and Australia. 2,000 meter camp, uh, well, you can call it a camp. Basically, there's a trail and a little verge along the trail, and so that's where everybody's tents went, and it was pretty primitive. Again, the forest up here is dominated by lithocarpus. We found evidence of the Sulawesi palm civet, which had never been recorded in this region of Sulawesi ever. Uh, more ticks, more nepenthes, and this is basically moss forest. So every surface in the forest itself was covered by a two or three inch layer, thick layer of, of moss. So here are the denizens of the high forest. This is the Sulawesi palm civet. We found scat and they're doing DNA on it, and it turns out that that's exactly what it is. This is what a Noah looks like. It's a very odd cow. Uh, and then the Sulawesi warty pig, and again, again, the pigs are very well protected because no one eats them either. But they, they do hunt the, the Anoa. Uh, Anoa are probably three, four hundred pounds, so not a very big animal, maybe about this tall. Not something you'd want to meet in the dark, the pigger. 
1,700 meters, it's like this practically all the time. So cloud forest, very wet, kind of cold. But you can see the shape of the tree. Here we're getting into more lianas, but this is a very typical form for the trees. 2,000 meters, there's a brief pass that goes over. We're still not close to the top of this mountain. It's another, say, 600 meters above this. But this is the trail. The trail is what's left of an old logging road. Now, when you get up to here, suddenly you're in another transition of plants. Lots more of this casuarina. Maybe you're familiar with a, a little low shrub along the coast, uh, say up and up. Mendocino Humboldt County called Salal. Well, Galatheria is a genus. There's a species here. So it starts getting really weird. The very top of the mountain, I'm told, is dominated by rhododendrons. There is a very nice sphagnum bog here. And that ended up being the drinking water for that camp. If you can picture what that was like. <laughs> and no one remembers bringing a water filter. So it was really brown and kind of chunky. <laughs> so we've had to six trips so far. The biodiversity just knocks your socks off. At the lower elevations, it's incredibly high. Probably because it's second growth forest, there's a lot of patchiness, so a lot of diversity, lots of edges, just phenomenal diversity. We have lots of new species, not just a few, but, but across the board in every group of organisms we looked at. I talked about the altitudinal transitions. These are very marked where you have whole groups of taxa, like Moraceae, for example, simply dropping out as you go up in elevation. And you get more of this boreal element showing up on the top of the mountain. Bioprospecting, very successful so far. Uh, but we still have tons of samples that we're processing. And then one of the interesting things that came out about this is both the impact of cocoa plantations on the forest and cropping systems. So one of the things we're looking at is, is working with the local growers to try to make this work better in terms of conserving the forest. So here's one of our productions where we're actually drying down or trying to dry plant samples to take back for, for chemical extraction. All of that had to be lugged down on somebody's back, basically. And then we had to get it to the airport to be shipped to Berkeley. So these huge bags and things had to go through, we had to get them through customs, they had to go to Berkeley. There was about I don't know, 600 pounds of plant material. I'm sure Lynn was ecstatic to get this. Bio prospecting. So we have a number of new cellulases that show industrial promise. These are things that break down lignans and cellulose uh, very effectively that we've extracted from the gut of wood boring beetles. We also, some of the plant material, the trees, showed several compounds of anti-cancer, particularly breast cancer, efficacy. And so those are going into the whole screening uh, mode right now to see whether they're worth trying to put into the pharmaceutical industry or not. Okay, this is the really scary part. And this is why Sulawesi really shouldn't be overlooked. We estimate the number of insect species on this mountain is about 100,000. Half of those are probably new to science. Half. So you want to commit suicide as a taxonomist, this is a number that will do it for you. Birds. Almost 500 species. Over half of those are found nowhere else on Earth except Sulawesi. Mammals. Same thing. Plants. Same thing. Snakes, they swim, so there are more of them that are found on other adjacent islands, but 28% of those are endemic, and there may be some new species there, too. We know these numbers are also going to be very high because amphibians and freshwater fish don't disperse particularly well. We just haven't pulled together the numbers yet. So 
my colleagues who work on birds and mammals, I had to make sure that they fully understood that their bats and birds were simply carriers for my insects. <laughs> so this is one of the new species of bat flies that we got from one of these little bats. This is a mist net. I don't think, I don't know if you can see it very well, but this is this is the way you get them when you have to try to disentangle them without destroying the mist net. And they're going ah, 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 <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> so here's one of these little bats. And here you can see one of the bat flies on it. Now this is a small bat. That tray it's sitting on is only a, mm, say four by six. And actually it turns out we discovered that these little trays, I don't know if you recognize it, but this is the kind of tray that you get on an airplane with food on it. Thank you, Garuda Airlines. We all stole one every time we flew. Lots of beetles. This is the kind of thing that, you know, these are all described, right? They're big, phenomenally flashy, charismatic things, and, and they're all pretty well known. The moths. I just put a few pictures in. Phenomenal diversity. Oops. So, I mean, that's a moth. Butterflies, very cool things. Probably bright blue on the top surface, but that's what you get underneath. The caterpillar is equally diverse. You have things that are either showing morning coloration or they're just hiding, but you really don't want to touch these either or they're looking like a rotten dead leaf or even a parasitized caterpillar. They're really diverse. The caddisflies, that's not even as colorful as they get. Lots of dragonflies and, and damselflies. So what, this is what we have so far. A minimum of 25 species of insects that we've actually recognize or the taxonomists we're dealing with have recognized. One new bat species, two new lizards, a new shrew, one new rat. And when I say rat, it's probably not the genus ratus, but these are nice fluffy rodents with long black and white tails. They're, they're quite attractive. At least two new fish, a land crab, and a new genus of species of bamboo for this site. So I don't know how many of you saw this thing in the newspaper, but this is our, our spectacular new genus of crab one. And it, it turns out it's a new genus and species. We can't put it in anything. So we're going to be describing this. We'll be naming it the species Garuda after the Indonesian symbol of uh, national symbol. Here's a new Amagila bee with the tongue on this thing. Phenomenal. This is uh, about the size of a small bumblebee. Here's a new sawfly. Not exactly a subtle creature. Many, many new damselflies. Damselflies in this region tend to overposit their larvae develop in small pools of water, even phytotelmata sometimes, and so they tend to be extremely localized. In this mountain, they're pretty much endemic to the mountain. Oh, new fungus gnats. People do get excited about these. <laughs> but they're kind of nice looking for fungus gnats. Um, odd biologies. Now this is one of the other twists in this region is that we all think of blowflies being bright metallic colors. And we think of house flies being sort of blah brown flies. But in fact, this is a musk and this is a house fly. We think of, and the blowflies are brown and nocturnal, and they didn't like our poop. But, <laughs> but also, we, we tend to think of tsetse flies being the only thing that larva posits. And in fact, this genus Neomaya larva posits. We don't know how they make a living, but they produce one ginormous maggot, which then drops to the ground, pupates, and does the same thing that tsetse flies do. I was amazed. And then with cocoa farming. Wow, you know, I've had to really rethink my obsession with chocolate after being on, in this field site for as long as I have. The way they are growing in this region has tremendous impacts on both the forest itself and on the watershed. Lots of insecticide and fungicide use, overuse of fertilizer, 
So biological control agents are few and far between, but you've got this phenomenal forest surrounding your cocoa plantation that's loaded with egg parasites, pathogenic fungi for insects, all kinds of things. Then the way they grow the trees themselves are problematic, and then they're post-harvest. Imagine trying to get chocolate beans dry where it rains 400 inches a year. You know, so all these things, kind of one of the outcomes of this is that we had a very clear idea of how they might make this work and conserve the forest at the same time. So, so here is sort of your typical production. This is a cow pod. This is a healthy one. It's not ripe yet. They turn bright, sort of yellowy orange when they're ripe. They have flowers produced along the, the primary trunks. And this little thing is the pollinator. So they're midge pollinated, which when you're using the number of insecticides that they use becomes problematic. How do you actually get the fertilization done if you're spraying everything? And then this is how they, they sun dry the, the cocoa beans. So here are just two of the compounds that they're using. Okay, seven, you guys are probably familiar with seven. It's bad enough. This is endosulfane. It's a chlorinated hydrocarbon. It is one of the most vertebrate toxic insecticide ever produced, and it really kills fish. So they're applying these compounds three times every two months in these orchards. It rains all the time, so they apply it. It sluices off into the river. Everybody feeds on fish. That's where their protein comes from. So everybody's getting a dose of this. This has not been legal in the United States in at least 40 years, and maybe it never was. It's so toxic. They use backpack sprayers without protective clothing. These, these are illiterate farmers. They're being sold this stuff. The other thing I want to point out, and this is something that didn't occur to me until this second trip, is that look at the leaves. So this is the forest, this is the floor of the plantation underneath the chocolate trees. There is no decomposition going on in those leaves at all. It, it is simply stopped. There is new, no nutrient cycling there. You see so much fungicide in these orchards that it is shut down, decom. Right? So then they have to use fertilizer because there are no nutrients in the soil because they stopped decomposition of leaf litter. Mm, chocolate. <laughs> We found biological control agents. So these are, are plant hoppers. They're feeding on the pods. You can't see it very clearly. They're covered with path, endopathogenic fungi. This is on the edge of a plant, the plantation I just showed you the insecticide tins from. So we know it's there. It's just simply a question of getting them to alter cropping practices at the other end. And then here's another problem. So instead of say composting the pods or turning them into charcoal, they just simply dump them in the or on the edge of the orchard. Well, our midgeries, this little mosquito here, loves to breed in these. You've got about a cup of water in each one of those. The first time I saw one of these dumps, I thought I was having trouble with my eyes because all I could see was sort of this blurry gray silhouette of, of the dump, and it turned out it was mosquitoes overpositing into the little pools of water. So, this is your sort of connection to Japanese encephalitis, dengue fever, chicken glumia, which is found in this region. And then the drying. So what happens is chocolate that's taken from these orchards, these are small growers, they can take it down to Tinakari, which is this little village. There is a man there who owns this little hostel that we stay in. He's the broker for the chocolate. They, he buys it from them. Then he goes across the isthmus, across the bay to Makassar, where the major buyers are, and then he brokers it to them. So when you're eating chocolate sold by Mars, for example, or Cadbury, if they're buying from these brokers, they have no idea what's happening in these plantations. Because they're at least two or maybe three steps or more removed from the actual people who are growing the chocolate. So, we now have been negotiating with the Indonesian government, Mars Corporation, and 
U.S. Agency for International Development to actually further explore the issue with chocolate production in Sulawesi. Sulawesi turns out to be, right now it's the third largest producer of chocolate in the world, after two countries in Africa. With the problems in Ivory Coast and Ghana, it may be number one in the very near future. So they've got to get a handle on this. Um, so we're actually looking to go in and survey two more watersheds the same way and see if we can come up with predictive tools about how you manage agriculture, forest conservation, conservation of certain organisms that they're particularly focused on, maybe mining fisheries and make it all work. Because the other problem is right now international agencies and NGOs are putting huge amounts of money into coral reef conservation. Well, what the heck good does it do you if you're conserving coral reefs if you've got endosulfan flowing down the rivers into the coral reefs? You know, so if you don't work upstream, you can't actually make a difference at all. And this is the other problem, because the other thing that's happening in Sulawesi is because of the kind of geology you have on this island, it is very rich in nickel, gold, uranium, and other minerals now that are very highly sought after. The Chinese have moved in, and this mountain range that we've been surveying is now, the mining rights have been bought by a Chinese company, and this is how they mine. So that entire mountain range can turn into an open pit mine, which will not only take out our lovely biodiversity, but all the chocolate plantations, the coconut plantations, and it will destroy the fisheries because they dump the mine waste on the beach. So it is a place of huge contrasts. You have to understand that when you go into a place like Sulawesi, Indonesia has a government which is distant. The central government's in Java. That's like five mile islands away. Indonesia consists of roughly 17,000 islands. So as an entomologist, you have to think about something else. Okay, we have this fabulously diverse island here, but if you think about the entire country and how you would manage, say, insect pests or plant pests, what do you do when everything you have is a border? That's all you have is borders. How do you control something like that? You cannot regulate the flow of people between islands, much less insect pests. So what you have to do in a situation like Indonesia is you have to learn how to accommodate or cope with once it's there because it will always be there. So pest management takes on an entirely different, needs an entirely different approach in a place like this because you can't quarantine, you can't control, you can't regulate. So biological control becomes even of more importance in a place like this than anywhere else. If you don't have those intact forests, this is what we're starting to find with our research, if you don't have the intact forests as a source of pathogenic fungi, parasitoids, and so on, um, you will end up burdened with using massive amounts of pesticides and so on to, to try to keep a lid on the situation that you have. <coughs> So right now we're sort of struggling with this issue. We're trying to get publicity that will make this more difficult. The central government is not permitting this, but of course they're five hours away by plane, and so the local government, which is taking payoffs from the companies, is most likely going to allow the money to take place unless it becomes publicly embarrassing. So we're sort of in that situation now. And after all the work we put into that site, we would sure hate to see anything happen to it. So, um, our future goals, we want to take one further step. Instead of just doing the biodiversity of everything that moves, crawls, or grows, we want to bring in hydrologists. We want to look how these watersheds actually function, how the water moves through them, as a way of looking at how the insecticides and other compounds actually move through the forest and see if there's a way of demonstrating clearly whether or not forest, healthy forests actually make for healthy agriculture for these situations. It looks like it will because they're spending so much money on chemicals now for control of fertilizer that if they didn't do that, they would probably come out far ahead even if 
they have small losses from pests. The health issues along with the insecticide exposure are enormous. So that's kind of where we are right now. We're right in the process of negotiating with Mars for support, and USAID just gave us the go ahead to pull in, put in a full proposal for a million dollar grant to collaborate over there in Silver Winter Z. So, yeah. tribal groups, they actually want to conserve the forests, but then you have this foreign element, you know, pushing to harvest the forests or to do the mining that's interfering with that. A lot of it is simply ignorance. Uh, their educational system, there are two things I found out about Indonesia that I found kind of shocking coming from the West. And one is that there is no public education in Indonesia. It's all private. So if you have an education, it means you come from a wealthy family. So there are a lot of illiterate people, but everybody has a cell phone. I mean, everybody has a cell phone. And so you can actually educate and reach people electronically the way you never could any other way. And that's actually one way we're going to try to exploit you know, the electrons to try to get inform people in the area, train college students in Kandari to actually do sort of quantum extension sort of uh, networking. And m and Mars also has a system of deploying, uh, I guess you'd call them extension agents, paid for by the company that actually assist with helping growers do better production, handle the trees better, look at the past issues better, and so on. So, I think it's just a question of getting that set up, but we also want to be able to do real-time video feed out of the field of the sites. So, yeah. yeah. So can you uh, say a bit uh, more about the vital prospecting? And what's the precedent? Uh, what expected to come out of this? You mentioned a couple uh, possible. Uh, Our specific focus was to look for anti-cancer agents and to look for industrial enzymes, uh, lipases, and cellulases. But, I mean, where do you start? Uh, what do you mean when you say search for a cancer agent? I mean, what, what, is, what do you mean? What you do is you, you do a lot of screening. So there are labs at Berkeley that screen for activity in different compounds. And I, I don't know the chemistry, but they do extractions of all this plant material that we send them. We also send them insects that have that are of interest, say something that sequesters toxins or molloids, things like this. So you send them dead insects? Yeah, or whatever tissue, or tissue, depending on what it is. The other thing we're doing is there's a lab, a forest service lab that actually screens for cellulases, and they've collect, teamed up with, I forgot the forest service on there, but they've teamed up with uh, Curia Bounty Mills the yeast collection here, we're doing microbial uh, rearing and extractions looking for compounds like the cellulase. And what's the arrangement with the local? So, so you discover a cancer agent or some uh, insect? Uh, it's all split 50 50. Split. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we have very, very robust uh, material transfer and intellectual property agreements with Indonesia. And it's not only with the federal government, but it's also with the Sulawesi government. And that also spins down into the local villages where we're doing the extractions. Yeah. yeah. With regard to the water quality, does the project have um, like water chemists that do samples of uh, look for pesticides or? No, we, we don't, and it's it's really a, that wasn't the original goal of the project, but that's what we're going to expand into. Okay. Because we want to see where this stuff goes. Yeah. Right now, no one has any idea. Um, Mars and in other parts of Sulawesi are doing that, but not 
they were a little embarrassed because I, I actually talk, gave a talk to a group of them and, and um, they were kind of shocked when I started showing them pictures of the insecticides. One of the things about Indonesia is that um, garbage is not disposed of, it's kind of dropped wherever you are. And so you can tell everything has been used in those orchards because it's all there. <laughs> they just leave it there. So if it's not metal and, and reusable, it just there there it stays. And so all those tins are there. Yeah. Well then is there any indication how the orchards are being treated by the Chinese corporations that are working here? Um yeah, I don't know. In the mining situations, I, I don't really know. I, I know that, that the locals are pretty unhappy with it because of just the environmental destruction. I suspect the money's good, but that doesn't carry you forward after the mine is over and there's nothing left, which is what's happening in a number of places. I mean, there literally is nothing left. So, yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about land ownership, how that works out there, and agricultural expansion, if that's how much of that is left. You know, I'm, I'm still not clear how it is that someone gets acreage there. Now some of this I think it's kind of like homesteading and the government if you can actually demonstrate that you're producing on some acreage, the government actually will give you title to it in some, some fashion. Um, it's not like New Guinea where tribal groups actually own the land. Uh, a lot of it is kind of not spoken for. So the government is more or less in charge of it. And they tend to simply grow out like cancers. So because the plantations aren't terribly healthy, the trees aren't very substantial, very healthy, they tend to just continue to plant more and more and more to try to increase their product, their production as opposed to actually focusing on making the trees more productive and healthier. They, they don't know. You know, they're they're doing this by the seat of the pants. They get advice from the chemical companies. They get advice from other local growers who are probably just as uninformed as they are. Yeah. I'm curious about the effects of the earlier logging. I mean, you mentioned there are old logging roads or tracks now. Did, do you think that it caused an expansion of, of, of the settlement into the regions of the previous city, just uh, emerging forest? Uh, that's A. And then secondly, is there any uncut forest left, or is the entire watershed, the entire mountain range, do you get it completely? As far as I know, the very top of the mountain is still intact, but everything from about 2,000 meters down is now second growth. Yeah. And I, I don't know, because the plantations only go up to about 700 meters. And so I think really what's happening is people are simply expanding up from the little village. I don't think that the logging really made that much difference, except that, because there are no roads. I mean, even to get to those two plantations we work out of, you have to wade up the river. So don't ask me how to get the chocolate out. <laughs> I don't know. On their backs, that's how everything goes. <laughs> Yeah, we we actually in, in last winter when the group went and Bob went with that group, they'd hired porters to carry materials in, but the porters didn't want to go up to a thousand meters. There was uh, there supposedly had been a murder. The Rattan collectors had actually fought, and somebody had been killed up there, and so there was sort of bad feelings about that. And then there's. There's also mythology associated with the top of the mountain, that there's supposed to be a, a bad spirit that lives on the top of the mountain. So anyway, they took things up, they got almost to a thousand meters, and then they dumped everything and ran back down the hill. And so the team that went in basically discovered that they had nothing. They had no tents, they had no food, and they had to pick it up all up and down the mountain with the porters and left it. So you're kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you learn how to work with the local folks and make sure they don't do that kind of thing because it, it's very risky to me. You know, there's no getting off this mountain in an emergency. So if somebody had a blown appendix or they got a bad infection or something, by the time we get them off, they'd be dead. It's, it's, there's no way of getting a helicopter in there because of the weather. And the closest helicopter is one of the mines. So it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's real old-fashioned kind of expedition stuff. 